I'm firmly of the belief that a story ultimately isn't as important as its storytelling. I feel that premise is something that is often given too much importance placed upon it from both creators and audiences. That an idea being completely original, complex, or subversive takes precedence over how well that idea was actually executed. This is of course a balancing act of trying to avoid being either a diamond in the rough or a gleaming polished turd. But in the right hands, starting with a seemingly rudimentary source of inspiration can often lead to a surprisingly robust and organic grown narrative. Digimon Adventure, a short film with a directorial debut by none other than Mamoru Hosoda, is the first entry in the Digimon anime franchise, and it couldn't have started from a more basic bitch source. Created from nothing but a series of digital trading pets released in 1997, it would be very easy to think that it would be nothing more than a churned out cynical promotional tool. And it very well could have been, but in its final execution, ends up being a phenomenal little piece of fiction. If you haven't seen the short, I urge you to watch it beforehand. It acts as an almost completely standalone pilot for the TV anime, the show in fact was greenlit on the strength of its storyboard, and it can be watched without any prerequisite viewing or interest in the franchise. The short follows two young siblings, Taichi and Hikari Yagami, who discover a strange little creature that hatched out of an egg that materialized out of their dad's computer. What starts off as wacky hijinks of them building up a friendship becomes considerably more dangerous, as not only does the creature's rapid evolution make it more unstable, but also with the discovery that it's not the only one appearing. It's a cautionary tale of an exaggerated take on children keeping a wild animal as a secret pet. At first it's cute and exciting, but quickly taking care of it proves to be too strenuous and full of drama for an in-over-the-head kid, and eventually leads to potential danger and damage once the animal starts to grow. That's one of the biggest strengths about the piece. Despite the fantastical nature of the premise, it goes to great lengths to keeping things feeling grounded and treating itself with genuinely weighty stakes. Hosoda stated in an interview in the Digimon movie book in 2001 that, my goal is to depict unrealistic things in a realistic way. Unbelievable creatures may be appearing, but the world is believable, the way the characters act is believable, and the characters' reactions to these creatures are believable. With one small exception of this part where Taichi his mother is just like, Oi, my seven-year-old son, we gone three o'clock in the morning, I kids, you'll be right, eh? Pick me up some fucking zigs on the way back. The characterization is very on point. Both Taichi and Hikari are amazingly adorable and likable, as is their differing and evolving relationship with Koromo. Though its limited runtime and nature as a prologue means the short can't give them the level of depth that they do in the TV anime, they are still what anchors you to the story, and they both run a wide gamut of emotional states that flow in a great narrative progression. Basically going from, haha, what little cuties, to, holy shit, these fucking kids are gonna fucking die. That's always been the sort of secret to the digital Digimon franchise. The excitement from the actual Mon fights are tertiary to the characters overcoming their personal demons. Which is why, as exciting as it is, a no-holds-barred brawl between two kaiju doesn't hold a candle to the amount of hype produced by a seven-year-old boy blowing on a whistle. This all leads to the atmosphere having this sort of double-layered nature about it, like it creates a fusion between two seemingly paradoxical perspectives. The first being the viewpoint of a child, and the second a much more removed, almost omniscient angle. On one hand, the information delivered to the audience is mostly only relevant to a child's world view. The Yagami apartment has the most prominence and feels special, with the outside world seeming comparatively undetailed and foreign. Adults lack any real presence, with even their parents being out of focus, and the why and how any of these events are happening are never revealed or developed. We only learn what the kids themselves are capable of learning, which leads to the whole situation seeming overwhelming and palpably terrifying by the climax. This is reflected through the composition. For the most part, shots are framed from the eye level of a child's height. Adults' faces are cut off by the top of the frame, a la Peanuts, and the terrifying titanic monsters being seen from low angles, shrouded in harsh shadows and unsteady framing. Conversely, there are these wider high angles, viewing the scene with just that bigger glimpse at the larger picture. This is indicative of its other overlapping perspective, as tonally, everything has a grounded, mature feeling to it, one beyond that viewpoint of a child. Running alongside the childish fear of monsters is the adult fear, the fear of your child or children in general being alone, facing danger, helpless, wanton to the whims of nature and causality. Ultimately, it comes across as someone looking back on their past childhood drama, recalling their emotional state at the time, but being able to view it in a much more wizened light, which is tech 
technically what is happening with the bookends of Taichi from his age in the show, but that guy's like 11 then, so yeah, I, I, I don't know how wise he should be, but I'm not saying. Hosoda himself talks of this contrast, saying that normally a child would only be able to look up at a kaiju, but by setting the action in an apartment complex, I could allow the audience to look over the action, like some sort of coliseum or a ring where kaiju would fight, and frame the children as part of the audience. And that's really interesting. Especially when compared to the visual approach to Hosoda's other Digimon short. Our war game has a much more simple, visceral entertainment vibe to it, and presents what is happening with more proscenium shot framing that lacks any specific perspective. Unlike in the pilot, the children have a sturdy grasp on the situation and take direct action immediately towards solving it. As our war game takes place after the TV anime, this perspective shift seems to represent the maturation of Taichi and Ko, from only focusing on you and your immediate family, to being much more aware of the greater world around you. They are no longer simply part of the audience. This maturation is reflected in the way the character designs are rendered, which I prefer to the TV models, though both versions were created by Nakatsuru Katsuyoshi. Though they lack a little in specific details, they are overall much more anatomically sound and solidly drawn, especially since they don't have the freakish ogre hands and feet like in the TV anime. And though there is very little in the way of shading, I'm really a huge fan of one-tone shading, both as a testament that the drawings display volume without it, and for ensuring the color design is as balanced and appealing as it is. I could do an entire video to talking about misconceptions around shading and budget and good animation. How do you be that incorrect about everything? But the short of it is that the lack of shading makes these designs particularly animation friendly, allowing for more quickly and easily created expression and fluidity with the character animation, and making the moments that are heavily shaded take on much more power. In general, I love the direction of the shot composition. There is a nice balancing between proscenium and geometric framing against more dynamic angles, as well as the good mix between wides and close-ups. Overall, I think the film is a visual treat from start to finish. I also love the direction of the sound. The only track in the score, aside from the classic OP Butterfly during the end credits, is Maurice Ravel's ballet suite, Bodero. Though some versions clock in at around 15 minutes long, it really only has the one section of leitmotif repeated constantly throughout. The amount of mileage that is gained out of that leitmotif, however, is actually kind of amazing. Simply through the changing of intensity, tempo, and which instruments are in the mix allows for an incredibly versatile range of emotional states, despite the fact that it's using the same set of melodies every time it appears. Though I know that a big reason why it was probably used was because Bolero is in the Japanese public domain, that it was utilized as well as it was, I think deserves mention and praise. One of the main feelings that the Digimon Adventure short gives off is that all the events were a false start. These creatures appeared by accident. The children and world weren't prepared to handle them or even comprehend what was really happening. It could barely even be called a trial run for what they go through in the series. It's ironic then, that as the first Digimon anime, and the first thing Hosoda has ever directed, that it's easily the best part of the franchise, and I wouldn't falter at all at calling it the best thing Hosoda has ever directed. Ultimately, I think the best thing about Digimon Adventure is that it can completely stand on its own. It requires no previous knowledge of the franchise in any respect, and ultimately doesn't even really need to facilitate a desire to watch the rest to be an enjoyable experience. Which quite honestly is probably for the best, as though I still find merit in the TV anime, barring the episode Hosoda guest directed, it doesn't have the same vibe or nuance that the short does. So I think it's a good thing that those who wouldn't find anything to enjoy from the show can still find something in the short. Our war game is also a pretty great romp, with a similar level of directorial nuance despite being more straightforward and silly, but it comes with the prerequisite of needing to be a Digimon fan on some level. And also if you've seen Summer Wars it's the same story, just better. <laughs> I could not recommend this short enough. And if you're one of the lucky people who has never seen how it was massacred in the affront to the sanctity of life known only as the Digimon movie, well... Uh, good for you, keep it that way please.